Hello, my name's Chinny McDonald. Um, my day job is director of Theos, the religion and society think tank. I'm also vice chair of Greenbelt Festival and a trustee of Christians and Media. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon is um, some of the content from my latest book, God is Not a White Man and Other Revelations. Um, excuse me while I kind of calm down a little bit. My, my four-month-old boy is somewhere in the building being pushed around uh, by my sister, and I need to forget that he's here because I'm just going to be thinking that he's, whether, whether he's asleep or screaming. But anyway, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, I hope at a couple of points to just stop and pause and reflect and maybe have some conversations, and I want to leave enough time at the end for us to maybe have a discussion or Q&A, um, but let's see how we go. So I want to tell you about the first time that I encountered God in my image. It was in reading uh, The Shack, uh, a book called The Shack, if anyone remembers it, which was turned into a film. Um, like millions of others, I've been reading this book, and it was a New York Times best-selling novel by Canadian author William P. Young. And it tells the story of a man who, um, torn apart by unspeakable tragedy, encounters God in the middle of a shack, in the middle of nowhere. And God, in the film and in the book, is in three persons. God is represented by the Holy Spirit in the form of an Asian woman, Jesus in the form of a Middle Eastern man, don't know where they got that from, um, Papa, God the Father, in the form of a curvy black woman. And those who had read the book before were careful not to give spoilers, like I just have, but so I, when I encountered Papa in the pages of this book, I was left open-mouthed, because I had never hit, imagined God to be portrayed in this way. I remember afterwards calling my mum, who had read the book before me, and we were excited and we were overwhelmed, but we were also at certain points rendered speechless. Because here, God looked just like us. When the Hollywood film came out after the book, some years after, God the Father was played by Octavia Spencer, who you can see here who ironically had played a maid, Minnie Jackson, in the civil rights film, The Help. She went from being playing The Help to The Almighty. And seeing her on screen brought it home to me even more. Here she was, this beautiful, curvy black woman playing God. And it's hard to describe what this meant to us. It's not something that I had ever been campaigning for, or calling for, or even consciously thought about. But there was something really liberating in seeing, even for that short period on that screen, a God in whom me and my mum could really see ourselves. And I think there's something about that point which is deeply theological and comes, goes to the heart of what our faith is. And I write about this in the preface to my book, where I open with uh, taking you back to Cambridge University where I'd been studying theology. Um, I went to study theology wanting to be a journalist, so I had approached theology like a journalist, objectively. So I'll read from that. In this place, I had attempted to present a simple reading of theology as a series of intellectual arguments listed one after the other. This theologian thought this, and that theologian thought that. Like the journalist I wanted to be, I had attempted to take myself out of the story achieving in my essays the goal of being that objective writer, a faceless observer. I had presented few of my own thoughts, feeling them to be unimportant and potentially distracting in writing academic essays about the nature of God. I have spent much of my life continuing to do this, making myself smaller, accommodating the expectations of how others want the world to be, while patriarchal influences draw a box in which women must sit and conform, white supremacy quietens the unique voice of a black experience. And there isn't much room for both. And perhaps I should have listened much earlier to the lesson that my supervisor at Cambridge taught me, that my voice matters, who I am matters, not merely in the social justice or political sense, but because when it comes to theology, the personal account is just as important as the historic 
academic or intellectual. In the same way, my life experiences also matter. And this is arguably more true of theological explorations than it is of any others. Since God cannot be seen or touched in a physical sense, we can only experience God spiritually in our inner beings. And our experience of God can then only be relayed through our words, our speech, a translation exercise taking place in which communicating our experience of God cannot escape being shaped by our histories, by our social contexts, by our genders, by our racial backgrounds, our individual stories. It's these personal stories that shape our knowledge of the divine. How can God be revealed except through the variety of different personal stories, physical realities, and cultural contexts in which humans experience God's presence? A 17th century philosopher, John Locke, wrote, God, when he makes the prophet, does not unmake the man. Now, my problem, however, is that most of my life, having grown up in the church, the picture that has been presented to me is that God values some attributes, namely whiteness and maleness, as supreme. In my 30 plus years of mainly white majority church contexts, I felt in many ways other and inferior as both black and a woman. So in writing my book, God is not a white man, I came face to face with that reality, but also with the trauma of the lie that the church has perpetuated over years, over centuries, about people who look like me. One afternoon during my research for my book, I found myself overwhelmed with grief. I was sobbing, and I wondered where that had come from. I realized that the cry that day had come as I'd read the arguments that had been put forward by Christian men and women about whether or not black people were in fact made in the image of God, like white people were. As I scanned the diagrams of the faces of black people alongside those of apes. I was reading about Charles Carroll, who in 1900 argued, he believed, on the basis of scripture, that black people's destiny was to serve white people. And he wrote a delightfully titled pamphlet named The Negro, a Beast, or in the Image of God. The 19th and early 20th centuries saw a number of different pseudoscientific and religious thinkers arguing about whether or not black people were actually humans. Now, as I say that, obviously most of us would find some of this, a lot of this, all of this unpalatable to believe that the Christian faith ever found its way anywhere near such beliefs. Reading about the manipulation and distortion of the Bible to prop up the most extreme white supremacist narratives made me feel sick, but also ashamed. We've, of course, moved far from such views, but what I want to say is that there are vestiges that persist in both subtle and unsubtle forms. 1900 was not that long ago. And sometimes the Christian story becomes so bound up with whiteness and westernness that it's hard to separate Christianity from those things. And in many ways, we still hold up whiteness as super superior and anything other than white as inferior. And sometimes not just inferior, but invisible. Our voices for a long time have gone unheard. And these are some of the things I've been thinking about over these past few strange, traumatic years. And I want to take you back to the writing of the book when I started writing it in the original lockdown of 2020. And we were in the middle of this pandemic. We were queuing for hours to get into the supermarket. We were terrified of an, an, an invisible virus. At work, when I was at Christian Aid at the time, I'd been promoted into a dream job and I was trying to juggle um, work with furlough and a big team and juggling childcare with my husband, creating two hourly rotors to look after our son 
dealing with fussy eating and potty training um, and keeping him entertained. I say that because it was, the, it was the most stressful time. I'm sure it was for you too. But on top of that, I had six months to write the book. And in many ways, despite all of that, despite all that was going on, this was the absolute best time to be writing it. Because I was raging about all the injustices that had taken place against people who looked like me in 2020, but also over centuries before that. The rise of the Black Lives Matter movement following George Floyd's murder made us all ask questions about racial justice that we hadn't been asking so openly in my lifetime. But if I'm honest, by the time I watched George Floyd's murder on my phone, I had already become well acquainted with black death and black suffering. I'd come to expect the brutalization of black bodies from a very young age through observing and watching how black people cautiously navigated our way through the world and different contexts and witnessing how we were received. The clutched handbag, the subtle crossing of the street, how we were represented in art, in film, in entertainment. Blackness had long been associated with sorrow and suffering and death in my mind. I had grown up with on-screen portrayals of the violence committed against black people during the transatlantic slave trade by watching things like Roots or 12 Years a Slave or Django Unchained or The Birth of a Nation or Glory. And these films and this art has, throughout the years, in reinforced the idea that black people should expect violence and danger. And to some, whether that's consciously or unconsciously, a black person's body is seen as no different from a piece of property with which the owner can do whatever they wish. As James Cone cites in The Cross and the Lynching Tree, the people of the South don't think any more of killing the black fellows than you would think of killing a flea. We live very much in the shadow of these days when black people were the property and white people were the owners, when black bodies were rendered worthless. Black bodies like George Floyd's. And the reactions that I have to these stories, past and present, are often visceral and physical. I recall standing in my kitchen after doing some research with a book and being hit with what felt like relentless accounts of the violence against black people that had been justified throughout the centuries. As I was reminded of the inhumane conditions that enslaved people kidnapped from their homes in African nations were kept in. I could almost smell the blood, the salty tears and the sweat in the belly of those slave ships and hear the cries of those people who had gone from complete freedom to this nightmarish existence. I wept as I recalled the story of Reese Taylor, who was on her way back to her husband and young child after attending church on the 3rd of September 1944 with her friend when a car drove up and stopped next to them on the road. Inside the car were seven men who accused her of cutting a white boy in the town they forced her into the car at gunpoint and assaulted her. I shook as I recalled how I had learned that physician J. Marion Sims, the celebrated father of modern gynecology, practiced his surgeries without anesthesia on enslaved women, Lucy, Anarka, Betsy, and others whose names we do not know. The past 400 years of black history is a story of brutalization and violence. And it's really hard for people like me living centuries after some of the atrocities and an ocean away from the worst of it to separate ourselves from the cruelty experienced by those who have gone before us. When I read or hear stories of the rape of black women, the experimentation on enslaved black people's bodies, the whipping, the lynching, the killings, Sometimes it's as if I'm experiencing the violence myself. Monica Williams, a professor and psychologist, describes this as vicarious trauma. She argues that race-based stress can be triggered through viewing racial discrimination, brutality, 
violence or aggression through a third party, such as social media or watching the news, and suggest that racism should be included as one of the causes of PTSD. Vicarious trauma is both present and historic. When I see another black person killed, I experience it vicariously. And it also reminds me of the centuries of similar instances of violence against black bodies. And these are some of the feelings that people in your congregations and your churches might be feeling too. Since Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, the brutal murders of black men and women in majority white contexts have not disappeared. In recent years, we've seen many new hashtags. As actor Will Smith said in 2016, racism isn't getting worse, it's getting filmed. We've seen far too many hashtags with the names of brutalized black people. In the weeks preceding George Floyd's murder, we in the UK learned very quickly that the arrival of COVID-19 seemed to lift old bandages. We knew very soon that the pandemic was killing hundreds of thousands of people around the world, but black people were again being disproportionately affected. What we learned from the pandemic was that some people's lives mattered more than others. And perhaps despite centuries of apparent progress, black lives and black bodies didn't matter after all. In the discussions with fellow black Brits following George Floyd's death, I noticed a common and familiar thread. When we watched George Floyd being murdered, we saw our own necks on the line. That sense of vicarious trauma can cross the Atlantic, just as it can stretch throughout the decades. I believe it's because we see ourselves in our American brothers and sisters, precisely because we see ourselves in black people everywhere. And that's because I believe that close bonds form between oppressed groups in a way that can't be understood really outside those groups. And it answers the question that many people have asked, which is why do black Britons care that people are getting killed, black people are getting killed in America? In my country of birth, Nigeria, there's a strong sense of communal ties that can't be broken, and you get that in a lot of um, uh, communities in African nations. In the Zulu language, many of us have heard of the term Ubuntu, I am because we are. We see ourselves in George Floyd, just as we see ourselves in Breonna Taylor and Stephen Lawrence and Rodney King and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and lynched black men and women everywhere. James Cone again discusses a painting of a lynched man left at the doors of a church. It's painted by uh, Hale Woodruff in around 1935. If you look at this image closely, if you can find it um, somewhere, the, when the image meets the ground, when the lynched man's rope hits the ground, you can see that flowers are growing. And that tells me that there is beauty to be found in the midst of pain. And James Cone writes, the beauty in the black existence is as real as the brutality. And the beauty prevents the brutality from having the final word. Black suffering needs radical and creative voices, prophetic advocates who can tell brutal and beautiful stories of how oppressed black people survived with a measure of dignity when they were not meant to. Who are we? Why are we here? And what must we do to achieve our full humanity in a world that denies it? The history of black bodies at the hands of white supremacy has been marked by violence and brutalization and untimely death. It's a story that is retold and repeated in each generation. The tragic accounts of the deaths of those who didn't survive the Middle Passage to those unarmed human beings loved by God who were beaten or shot or suffocated to death at the hands of those who were supposed to protect them. We know that the story of black death is a devastating one, but at times in history it has been these tragic stories that have woken people up and spurred them towards seeking justice and demanding better. And it's some of these questions that I explore in God is not a white man, 
which begins with questions around the literal depictions of God throughout the centuries as a way to explore who society holds as less than. An omnipotent, all-powerful God represented as white and male. What does that say about white supremacy and patriarchy in the world and in the church? What does that say about people who are neither white nor male? Before I move on, I want us to just have a two minutes of just reflecting on what I have said um, individually. Just a pause. What struck you? What made you uncomfortable? What resonated with you? And what did you question? So just two minutes of pause and we might hopefully have some time at the end to and share some of those thoughts together. I should have asked at the start, but do we have roving mic capability? Okay. Just wondered if anyone wants to share a reflection, so not a question to me, but just a reflection from what I've said before, maybe about your context, anything that struck you, anything you disagree with, maybe if you hand up. Someone here? Thank you. Uh, this is just a brief reflection which I offer. Um, a few years ago, I was in Tanzania, um, and I recall very vividly being in a house, somebody's house, and the only picture of Jesus was indeed of a white man with those rather nice-looking white children at his knees. Um, so I just offered that. I'm going to come on to that. <laughs> On this side of the green top. I think what struck me, um, and I actually bought your book earlier and I've just started reading it over lunch, um, it's the sense that there was part of me that was wanting to say, yes, but this isn't me. Um, I'm a woman, so again, there's the, the idea of how is God represented? Does that represent, you know, does that reflect me? Um, I'm not English. I'm Welsh. We have our own history of um, conflict in some ways with uh, the ruling culture. Um, I come, you know, my, my grandfather worked in a coal mine. I have that kind of background of having to, or, or not being the ones in charge. So there's part of me that's wanting to say, but I'm not, I'm not the white people, and yet I am the white people. And I think it's that, you know, being a woman, being from what in some ways, and certainly 50, 80, 100 years ago, would have been called a cultural minority, Welsh working class, um, wanting to say, but I'm identifying with you and knowing very well that actually I'm not, I can't, I don't have um, your experience. And it's suddenly finding that I'm not 
the minority I thought I was. Thank you. We'll take, yeah, this gentleman here. Thank you for all your reflections, Chine. My thing that struck me was just when you said it was reading The Shack. Um, it was the first time you discovered a God made in your image who resonated with you because The Shack was published in 2007. I've just checked. I don't know when you read it, but I'm guessing that means you were probably mid-teens, late teens, something like that. Oh, no, I was older than that. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd finished university a couple of years before that. Okay, so, so even older then, and, and then plus your mum as well. And that has been normal for so long, and yet it, just hearing you say it out loud today made me think you had to wait an awfully long time to find that out, and that's just your experience that's been replicated. Um, and, and yeah, it struck me hard when you shared that story. Thank you. The last one, baseball cap here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Richard. Yeah, I was struck by the title, the actual title. And I think some of us have been educated and Many of us have experienced all sorts of things. I consider myself an old man now, even though I've got a baseball cap on. Um, but the title is a really powerful title. And I think some of the fear, some of the anguish, some of the pain that has been with many parts of the black community for many years is still there. And I still feel kind of nervous actually saying, God is not a white man. And I think that's what struck me, the confidence that you have to really share with us um, something that's very different to what's kind of perceived as what everybody agrees with or sees. Thank you. Maybe we can come on to kind of questions at the end if I can get through, um, because some of, some of the stuff that we've just talked about here, I'm going to go on to talk about particularly um, images, imagery of white Jesus uh, and what that does. And just to say, um, I realized I was brave for calling it God is not a white man when the book was out. And it was like, I, pro I, was, I probably, um, yeah, I got, some, I got some flack from some people, I guess, on social media, obviously who hadn't read it, but who, you know, said, oh, this is just part of the woke agenda, suggesting God isn't white. Um, but I didn't want to start a theological argument with them on Twitter. So... The next part, as I said, is around um, the faces of Jesus um, in particular. Um, in writing God is Not a White Man, I wanted to give voice to the experience of what it's like to be both black and female in a world that is in many ways designed to elevate both whiteness and maleness. I wanted to explore the, literal, uh, the, explore the effects of the literal depictions of God as both white and male. So God, as we know, as an old man who looks a little bit like Father Christmas, sitting on a cloud, and Jesus, kind of like this guy, a sandy-haired kind of hippie figure. And those images that all of us have grown familiar with. Now, you might say that you choose other images deliberately, but actually, if you ask most people on the street to draw Jesus, this is kind of what they would come up with. It's been really interesting hearing people's reactions to the title of the book. It seems obvious to most people who know anything or believe anything about God. Well, of course, God isn't a man. And of course, God isn't white. But if you look back at centuries of theology and practice within the church and imagery in art throughout centuries, you see white priest supremacy and patriarchy writ large. And that pervasive message that seeps in when you look at church leadership or the theological voices that are listened to, or even the very notion of Christianity itself as being a white European religion. Of course, while we might think it's obvious God is not a white man, the practices of the church to most looking um, 
from the outside in have suggested otherwise. My book isn't just about the literal depictions of God, but really I use it as a metaphor and an intended double meaning to say that not only is God not a white man, but white men are not gods. And explore how white supremacy is pervasive when we explore the feminist movement or interracial relationships or international development or how it's also pervasive in the church. A large part of what I explore in the book is these images, these images that we have of God. They're really important and reflect how we see ourselves. So as I mentioned, until I saw Octavia Spencer uh, in the shack or read the book beforehand, it had never really occurred to me that Jesus wasn't white. I mean, I sort of knew it, of course, but by the time I really woke up to the fact, it was far too late to reconfigure the image that I had of God in my mind. To this day, when I picture Jesus, I think of a piercing, blue-eyed man with a brown beard and sandy neck-length hair. He looks a little bit like Robert Powell in the 1977 Jesus of Nazareth film. Now, he doesn't look ordinary, but he definitely looks white. So that means that at times when I have pictured Christ on a cross, when I've cried out to him in my darkest moments, when I've prayed to him for those things that I've desired most, when I've sung praise to Jesus in worship, I've pictured a man who never existed. The Jesus I've clung to is a falsehood, a symbol created by the effect of white supremacist fiction, because God is not a white man. This revelation of all these things is really painful for me, and it brings with it a realization that the white supremacy has found its way into the most sacred place. Although painful, however, the realization that Jesus was not white has brought with it a profound sense of liberation. Most who've read the Bible or know any part of its history, whether they believe in Jesus or not, know that the incarnate God in human form would have looked like a man from what we've come to call the Middle East, born in Bethlehem. I've been fortunate enough to visit that wonderful, holy place and meet its people, each a different shade of brown. And the Jesus I picture looks nothing like them. But the thing is that white Jesus is the logical consequence of a world that values whiteness as supreme. The most famous artworks picturing Jesus from Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross, Hot to Holman Hunt's Light of the World, to Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, depict him as white with long hair and a beard. This image is the only one I have of Jesus, a consequence of the thousands I've seen throughout my life. Unseeing and reimagining white Christ in the minds of believers is almost impossible. In a world where whiteness is power, then of course, an omnipotent, all-knowing God must be white, because God could be nothing else. I think this image, the image head of Christ, might have something to do with all of this. This painting depicts an image um, we've come to understand as representing the archetypal Christ. It's Jesus with an extra dash of USA. He looks like he could be in a 90s Levi's advert. Um, He's got dark blonde wavy hair. He's got a perfectly shaped beard. He's looking up a candle somewhere flickering in the distance. And this image was created in 1940. And it's been described as the best known American artwork of the 20th century. It's been reproduced more than a billion times worldwide. Although its creator, Warner Salmon, is much less well known. Now, this isn't the only image of this type that we see, um, but it's the type that's become, the archetype that's become most recognizable. And this kind of bearded Jesus, bearded white Jesus, originated sometime during the Byzantine era, when the image of an enthroned emperor with long hair and beard came to be the predominant way of representing Jesus. Much later on, this evolved into the more hippie-like representation of Jesus we see today, 
white Jesus is the consequence of a number of Western historical, theological, and sociological prejudices that were so fundamental to the notion of white superiority that Christ could not have been anything but. And one of the main factors, argues theologian Sean Kelly in a book called Racializing Jesus, is that 18th century German theologians argued among themselves about the ideas that on one hand, Christ was ordinary, and on the other hand, he was completely otherworldly, divine. I remember my first introduction to the historic Jesus during lectures in Christology, and I found it, as an 18-year-old who'd grown up in evangelicalism, I found it shocking, this idea that Jesus was in many ways ordinary. But it's true that placed within the historical context of first century Palestine, Jesus could be seen as, quote, Sean Kelly, an essentially Jewish figure whose teachings were in line with those of other Jewish sages of the time. So what happened was those who wanted to downplay the ordinariness of Jesus and elevate his unique divinity subsequently became more anti-Judaism. Some theologians sought then to offer various solutions that stood Jesus apart from his Palestinianness and his Jewishness. And this led to the idea that instead Jesus was in fact racially Aryan, set apart from his Jewishness and his so-called ordinariness. So this white Jesus that we've become familiar with became a way of emphasizing Christ's divinity as distinct from the brownness of his historical context. Images of Jesus became less and less Jewish and more and more white as Christianity spread from the Middle East to Europe. It wasn't until I watched the BBC documentary Son of God that I properly took notice of the fact that the representation of Christ so ingrained in my mind didn't reflect the historical reality of his probable appearance. The reconstruction of the face of Jesus um, created by anthropologist Richard Neve and historians and archaeologists was not beautiful by Western standards we have been conned into thinking are objectively so. Since nowhere in scripture does it actually suggest that Jesus was physically different from those around him, we can assume that he looked similar to the average Galilean man of his day. As I've said, unseeing and reimagining white Christ in the minds of believers is very difficult, almost impossible. In a world where whiteness is power, then of course an omnipotent, all-knowing God must be white. In a book called White Too Long by Robert P. Jones in the US, uh, Jones writes that the emphasis on a personal relationship with Jesus that is front and center in white evangelicalism only served to cement the depiction of Christ as white. Well, one of the main tenets of Protestant Christianity is this idea that humans don't require a church or priest as mediator in order for them to have a relationship with God. Modern Western evangelicalism can at times give the impression that this relationship with Jesus is like one we might have with a brother or even a boyfriend. As Jones puts it, whites simply couldn't conceive of owing their salvation to a representative of what they considered an inferior race. And a non-white Jesus would render impossible the intimate relationalism necessary for the evangelical paradigm to function. No proper white Christian would let a brown man come into their hearts or submit themselves to be a disciple of a swarthy Semite. I obviously believe in a God who is a God of all who isn't just a white God or a male God. I believe in a God who is experienced by all. And I believe that no one has a monopoly on divine revelation. In Ephesians 2, we read, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself himself 
as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Here we hear of various groups coming together with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone, how Christ breaks down this dividing wall. The walls are broken down, but the diversity remains something we should celebrate. I think we need to address the racial power imbalances, what we portray as of value to God, whiteness and maleness. We need to, we need to redress those because it's in the celebration of diversity and difference, in seeing and hearing things in new ways, that we can be awakened again to the beauty of the Creator God. But my problem, and what I've experienced for most of my life in the white majority church, is that somewhere along the way, this truth about reconciliation and about dividing walls being broken down has been contorted into all sorts of messages that keep some with all the power and others without. I believe the church is supposed to be better than this. Not because we are better people, but because at the crux of the Christian faith is this crazy idea that like we read in Ephesians, there is no more dividing wall. Just like the barrier broken between God and humanity, the church should actively be the ones who break down the dividing walls that exist between people groups. When I talk about white supremacy, I'm not just talking about uh, the Klansman's capes or the subtle words that seem to betray the idea that white is right. White supremacy doesn't just have to come in literal chains and shackles, but in the narrow definitions of what and who is beautiful. White supremacy can creep out in the lack of welcome to anyone who is not white. It can come in the form of monochrome leadership, theology and practice. In my experience of church, despite the knowledge that God is that God of all, one might be forgiven for believing that our God values whiteness. White leaders, white theologians, white readings of scripture, white Western forms of worship are supreme. We might just believe that God is a white man. But I believe the kingdom of God should be like a mosaic, a tapestry of color, each part equal and in relationship with each other. A Christianity that is more focused on maintaining the status quo of white superiority, as if whiteness is something that God sees as worthy of protecting, is not the Christianity of Jesus Christ. It bears no resemblance to the New Testament's critique of empire and religious leaders who see themselves as pious, yet ignore the plight of the outcasts, the wounded or the subjugated. As Nadia Boltz Weber in the US said in a piece last month, the endless depictions of God as a white guy aren't just boring, they're blasphemous in their narrow specificity. Because God's image is seen and comprehended only in the mind-blowing diversity of all human forms. The wildness of human variation isn't a mistake. It is a sign of the glory of God. And yet we made it a sign for the value and ranking of people. Leave it to humans to take a gift and turn it into a curse. This is an image um, painted by uh, an artist called Lor Lorna Mae Wadsworth, and it's called The La Last Supper. And I think that it helps us to start to reimagine, or continue if you've already been on that journey, what Jesus is, who Jesus is, what Jesus means to us as individuals, but also to our communities. It helps us start to be a bit more creative. I want to end with a story that I think helps us recognize that each of us is made in the image of God. And it's a letter that I've written to my eldest son, who, and this letter is in the end of my book. You were two years old when you started to understand that the world was made up of difference and that people came in a variety of shades and colors. You knew far earlier than I thought you would that I am black when your father is white. I wondered if you were confused about that, whether it meant anything to you. I wondered whether any children had pulled your hair or excluded you or made you feel like you did not belong. I wanted to wrap you up in love. 
and shut out a world that ever made you question your worth. When we asked you what colour you were, you looked puzzled and answered, grey. Grey. Like an overcast day. And we knew right then that we would have to work hard to protect you from a world that might make you feel disappointed in yourself. One that might make you long for summer when your smile was already a sunbeam. You will always be our summer. So your dad told you that you were not grey, but golden brown. And your eyes lit up. You saw in golden brown your own radiance and worth. In golden brown, we saw the image of God in you. And God said that grey, black, white, or golden brown, it was always there. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. We've got a few minutes now, maybe, to reflect again, uh, or to ask me questions if you want this time, um, on what you've heard, what it means for your context, maybe, um, or any, anything. session this afternoon and, and for you know, the honesty and the personal narrative you've brought to that. It's very, very powerful and disturbing to hear um, you know, what, what you brought before us. Um, and clearly the whole sort of imaging of, of Jesus uh, it needs you know, uh, tremendous revisioning uh, and um, to uh, See, see Jesus as a, a, a Semitic and Middle Eastern is something which I think is beginning to be taken proper account of. Uh, Jesus obviously is a, is a cultural figure in the Middle East uh, and uh, as such traditionally viewed as a man although the picture you've shown us uh, also brings a, a, a new kind of challenge uh, which I think is very important. I wondered given that the second half of your talk focused very much upon um, Jesus uh, and the, you know, the maleness of Jesus as one person of the Trinity. I wondered what you had to say in relation to um, God, the Father, Mother, and the Holy Spirit in terms of imaging so that the feminine aspect of the divine is, is included maybe also in our picturing and that focuses not just on Jesus um, uh, but also upon the three persons um, and how that maybe can help to bring balance into uh, imaging and into our liturgy. Thank you, yes. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about, well, I've been thinking about it for years. Um, growing, up, growing up in the context in which I did, the thought of describing God as she was like, blasphemous. Um, but as I have kind of started to unpack some of these issues and re recognize actually uh, there, are, there are lots of images or metaphors that are kind of feminine or archetypally feminine um, in the Bible when used to describe God. And so how can we tell those stories more? How can we bring them out? Um, sometimes in, in kind of critique I might get from um, certain spaces about the, talking about the, the non-maleness of God. Um, or the female attributes of, of God, people um, think, again, it's you know, part of the woke agenda, um, but really it, it is biblical in many ways. Um, in the process of writing my book, I decided at that point to stop using male pronouns for God, um, and I haven't, I, you know, sometimes I slip up, but um, I haven't been, and it's been a real... Um, discipline for me in doing that, in kind of un unlearning and kind of recognising the, the importance of language and how it shapes how we view um, God. But what I was going to say was that some of the, we have to recognise, as I'm sure a lot of you do, um, the, the role of biblical translation and the patriarchal context in which 
uh, the Bible, the different uh, versions of the Bible were translated to the point where some of the kind of original Hebrew words that were, um, particularly for the Holy Spirit, for example, in the creation story, were feminine um, uh, words used to describe God and how we've kind of suppressed those or they've, they've got, those have got lost. So I think it's not just about political correctness or the woke agenda, but how can we do more to share that the non-maleness of God is a biblical concept. It's not just um, just not people just not not just people in 2022 trying to kind of correct things. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, some rather ill-formed thoughts um, on issues of power, uh, and it occurs to me that you know one of the associations that have been made historically between uh, male whiteness and God come from a, an understanding of, of who is powerful and, and what is power. And if God is powerful, then we look around us and we see who the powerful people are and we see white men. Um, and the need, therefore, perhaps to reimagine God as humble and filled with humility, uh, those sorts of things. But then the associated risks of saying that we want to imagine God as black as well as anything else and then falling into the trap of perhaps assuming therefore that if we picture God as a humble person, as a black person, then we are making an assumption that somehow black people have to be humble if they're to be images of God and that we need to move towards the possibility of powerful black people being understood as God. Oh, absolutely, yes. I think, and I think particularly in talking about um, it's difficult not to fall into stereotypes of what is male and what is female um, in terms of um, attributes. So when we say, you know, gentle and humble and, you know, and kind and compassionate, then we think, oh, well, that's, you know, those are kind of feminine attrib attributes of God. Um, but actually, it all needs kind of rethinking and recognising, you know, that, that we need to... God, the image of God needs to be broken out of a certain box, but also so do us as human beings. Um, we... we we don't conform to, you know, um, gender stereotypes in many ways. And so how can we, in kind of, in, in reshaping our conversations about God, also rec reshape our conversations about what it is to be human in all its kind of variety um, and not fall into stereotypes? Should we take the lot, should we take three? And then that'll be the, the last ones, I think. Um, one, thank you, Chinny, as always. And, and just to say that um, we in Southwark have an anti-racism charter. And a lot of folk have found a bit of difficulty in thinking, how can they embed it in their church communities, particularly in areas where there are not a lot of people of color or great diversity. And I think um, as we work on resources to help support the thinking just listening to you as I've read the book and I've talked to you before about this, this is the beginning of the journey for folk. Because when you think of an anti-racism charter, you start to think that the first thing that you think about is God is not a white man. Because God is all of us and we're talking about diversity. So wherever we are, whichever part of our diocese, whichever type of folk attend your church, having something that we pride ourselves on of how do we embed the anti-racism charter begins this conversation, not just because they're not people of color there, but we have to recognize that we are all made in the image of God and our churches need to reflect that whether people of color actually come to the church or not, because God is in the building and God is not a white man. <laughs> Thank you. And just to say, I'm not, I'm not part of the diocese, but um, Bishop Rosemary did actually do my um, interview with me for my book launch at Southwark Cathedral, which was an amazing experience. So thank you very much for that and all your support, as ever. Yeah, hello, my name is Rosemary, and I live in Clapham Common. I was just curious, right at the beginning, when you said you wanted to do a degree in theology because you wanted to train to be a journalist, I mean, was there any reason, presumably you had an interest in the subject, why you thought it was a particularly suitable topic, just any art subject or what, I wonder? Oh, that's a, that's a long, story, long story, but um, ultimately, I think the study, study of theology, 
at university level is it help, really helps you try to be objective um, because you are hearing a lot of opinions that are contrary to your own. You're going kind of deep into them. Um, you, so I learned in that process, even though my uh, supervisor said I was doing it wrong, um, <laughs> to, to be able to represent people's arguments and be an objective kind of faceless observer. Um, and that is what old school journalism is supposed to be about. And maybe it's kind of less so now, but um, it was really about that. Uh, I, I, basically, it also came down to the fact that I was doing work experience on The Independent when I was 15, and the features editor said, if you want to be a journalist, study anything and try and go to the best university you can, because, yeah, so, so that was kind of the kind of roundabout route. Um, ultimately ended up at my favorite subject at A-level, which was religious studies and theology. Thank you, my name is Aika. Um, I just wanted to encourage everybody here, just picking up on um, the image of, of God, uh, to, to check your, your children's Bibles and the images that you have laying around your churches and make sure that they are more up to date and they've got pictures of every different color people in them. Um, just, just recently, uh, there was a, a, a five-year-old uh, in my children's group who's got black parents, and they were really shocked when he said to them, no, of course God's white. white. And, and actually, we really need to start by just looking at the kind of images that we are offering our children in our churches, and that's a really easy win to start on this journey of looking into these sort of anti-racism charter. Thank you. And maybe I'll end with this then, um, but my four-year-old, I decided that it's probably time that we start having some theological discussions. So I said to him, I said to him what is God? And he said, uh, not a white man. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he knows. <laughs> Thank you. Last one? Oh, well, I... I think you should have the last word, Chine. <laughs> but, um, and I endorse everything that Rosemary and others have said. I, just a little bit of, of the journey. I have the book of um, Bible pictures that I was given when I was very young, which um, I loved so much that I stuck it, it all fell apart, and I was constantly sticking it together with pieces of sellotape. And um, I've never thrown it away, but... Um, Every image of it is an image that would um, horrify you. <laughs> but um, on my first visit to Africa, uh, like um, Debbie, it was to Tanzania, I was um, given a Makonde, one of the tribes, always carved Christ in their image. And, I, and, and it was a, a full three-dimensional depiction of Christ on a cross, long extended body. And um, I've always, very deliberately, partly as a lesson to myself, um, in my meeting room, I've always only had this as the only image and the only thing hanging on the wall. Uh, partly because each of our journeys, you know, we, we all, as you have, there are moments of discovery, but we also have to push ourselves forward, don't we, to a better place. And I think you've helped push us to a better place in a diocese that doesn't have any of the answers but does ask the questions. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. And can we express our appreciation? Thank you.